P. Azali Osmani, President of the Union of Comoros and the Chair of Africa Union. <clears throat> Your Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Your Excellency Mr. Musa Faki Muhammad, the Chairman of the Africa Union Commission, Your Excellency Isufu Muhammadu, Champion of the SCFTA and former President of Niger, Your Excellency Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Heads of Organs and Institutions of the Africa Union, Regional Economic Communities and Regional Mechanisms, Honorable Ministers, the Honorable Anwai Guru, Chairperson of the uh, Council of Governors, the Honorable Johnson Sakaja, the Governor of the City of Nairobi, Honorable Members of Parliament, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, I am greatly honored and delighted to highly and I have a high privilege to have this opportunity to welcome you to the city of Nairobi and to Kenya. The opportunity to host this summit and your visit to our country does a tremendous honor to our nation. I welcome all of you, your excellencies, ministers, and our friends from across the continent and beyond to Kenya. Let me just give you one or two tips about uh, Kenya. First, around the city of Nairobi, it is a city that has a canopy of very green on one side and also a national park in the city. Um, in the national park, which is maybe 10, 15 minutes from your hotel room, we have wildlife, lions and uh, all manner of uh, wildlife. We have tried to fence, but sometimes, as you know, wild animals, they break away from the fence. <laughs> so if you take time to walk around the city of Nairobi and you meet a lion, please be careful because they are wild. We try to keep them inside. Uh, secondly, let me also welcome you to Nairobi, to Kenya, and to give you some information that scientists, and I am one of them, uh, have proven that the earliest remains of man are in Kenya. And therefore, for those of you who know the history of humankind, this is where humanity began. And so while you are here and you feel at home, it is because you truly are at home. <laughs> so, and I want to give you my commitment that uh, as the people of Kenya, we are having a national conversation as to whether we should have any visa for anybody coming home. So next time, <clears throat> Next time you come to Nairobi, you might not need a visa. <laughs> Excellencies, it is difficult to overstate the fundamental importance of this summit and the momentous consequence of the transformative business we have assembled here to transact. You will recall that as a continental political community, we resolved unanimously to pursue the integration agenda with greater figure and focus. This commitment was underscored by the decision to formulate a suitable framework to effectively coordinate the diverse efforts undertaken through our eight regional economic communities and various mechanisms that is part of the ecosystem of the AU. It is evident from the variety of activity, enhanced efficacy, and viability of AU's agenda and the undeniable increase of the AU Commission's administrative capacity and overall vigor of the regional and pan-African integration efforts that the AU's commitment was honest, accompanied by demonstrable political will and a focused and effective implementation strategy. We are a busy continent that is going places. The young, clean, green continent of the future and we are determined to lead our march into this future as a united, 
empowered contributor of sustainable solutions for global problems, we are reasoning together, generating effective solutions together, implementing them together, facing our challenges head on together, making progress and getting results. This is what has brought Africa's implementation leadership to Nairobi. And the sum total of the agenda of the fifth media summit, which is this meeting. For this, I want to celebrate all of you who are here today, not just for making time to be here, but also for the work you do every day in taking the Pan-African Unity Project forward. For this is what the integration agenda is all about. Whether we are talking about regional economic communities or mechanisms or the broader continental effort, the unity of African people is our primary goal. I commend His Excellency President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt, for successfully chairing the Heads of State and Government's Orientation Committee, which has effectively steered AUDA NEPAD in its momentous breakthrough in achieving the Agenda 2063 aspiration of consolidating regional and continental integration. I also thank President El Sisi for successfully hosting the African COP, or the Implementation COP as it was called, the last conference of state parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change at Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. In November last year, it was at this COP that Africa firmly revealed to the world a new determination to project a clear, forceful, and united voice and claim its opportunity to contribute to resolving humanity's most serious existential threat, that is climate change. I salute with gratitude His Excellency President Ali Bongo Ondima, President of the Republic of Gabon, in his capacity as the Chair of the Economic Community of Central African States, for the progress he has made in stewarding collaboration among regional economic communities under the Interreg Cooperation Initiative. As a result, the ECAS and the Economic Commission of Western Africa States has made significant strides in strengthening maritime security cooperation. I also appreciate the work being done by His Excellency President Ismail Omar Goulet, the President of the Republic of Djibouti, who chairs the Intergovernmental Authority on, Deve on Development for his able leadership of IGAD's contribution to the progress towards agreement on the cessation of hostilities in Ethiopia and now the activities that we are all undertaking to ensure that Sudan returns to normalcy and takes up its place as a stable, peaceful country in our, con in our, in our, in our continent. <clears throat> Father, I am cognizant of the animated activities and excellent work that has brought much progress in ongoing projects and initiatives being undertaken across many spheres by the economic community of West African states under the able leadership of His Excellency President Bola Ahmed Tinubu of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The common market of East Africa and Southern Africa led by His Excellency Akainde Chilema, President of the Republic of Zambia. Southern Africa Development Community, SADC, chaired by His Excellency President Felix Antoine Shisekedi Shilombo of the Democratic Republic of Congo, the community of the Sahel, Saharan states, under the stewardship of His Excellency President of <coughs> Benin, Batis Talon, the Republic, the Arab, unit, Arab Union of the Maghreb, led by His Excellency Tayeb Pakush of Tunisia, and the East African community, under His Excellency President Evaris Ndaishimie of Burundi. I must also recognize and praise the good and excellent work that the AU Commission 
continues to do under the leadership of its chair, His Excellency Musa Faki Muhammad. This summit has been made possible by the able leadership of his team. These AU REC success stories establish without any doubt that a lot of great work is being done all over our continent and that in our time, African leadership is signaling urgency, focus, consistency, and determination to sustainably manage and solve prevailing challenges and develop robust instruments to anticipate and preempt future crises. With such commitment, we now have confidence to pursue sustainable development and shared prosperity and expect that Agenda 2063 is now firmly on course. The most compelling signal that African integration is unstoppable and that it will open doors for unprecedented socioeconomic transformation is the progress we have made in implementing the Africa continental free trade area. We must all be proud of this magnificent project and historic achievement by and for ourselves, whose positive effects will reverberate throughout the world for a long time to come. I am not exaggerating. Let us consider the bare facts of the matter. This single mechanism has inaugurated the world's largest free trade area. Under it, 54 countries have agreed to create a single market with a population of 1.4 billion people and a GDP of US dollars 3.4 trillion. The free trade area is projected to lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty and boost incomes by 7% or U.S. dollars 450 billion by 2035. As I have had occasion to remark before elsewhere, this is the magnitude of what typical Pan-African collective action can achieve, and we are only getting started. The progress we have, <coughs> sorry, the progress we have made by collaborating with unprecedented firmness of purpose in different domains including peace and security, regional integration, investment, trade and development, and climate change is of tremendous and positive transformative significance for us collectively. Agenda 2063 is our blueprint to deliver the Pan-African vision of an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa driven by its own citizens, representing a dynamic force in the international arena. Therefore, it is more critical now than ever before that we marshal our collective consciousness, willpower, solidarity, and unity to fulfill our fundamental generational mandate of introducing Africa as a new global power, ready and able to provide leadership towards a new industrial age that shall simultaneously usher in an era of inclusive development, shared prosperity, and effective climate action. We must therefore capitalize on the institutional reform momentum at the Africa Union to pursue the complete development of effective capacity to deliver Pan-African transformation. To do this, self-reliance ladies and gentlemen, is essential. And a fit for purpose institutional architecture is indispensable at the AU. At the moment, over 60% of our program's budget is financed by partners. The demands of our challenging time require an AU that can pursue multiple urgent and critical interventions using internally mobilized resources. The Pan-African movement has always been about sovereignty and agency. First and foremost, chronic dependence, even on well-meaning partners, is starkly inconsistent with the aspiration of independence, sovereignty, and agency. And I therefore believe that we must take seriously 
the recommendations that have been made towards making our organization an organization that stands on its feet and an organization that is funded by us. This is why we must make progress in exploring, developing, and implementing solutions like the Kigali decision, AU decision 605 of 2016. Similarly, you may want to know that that decision has now been implemented by 17 countries. We need to persuade all our other brothers and sisters in the other countries to come on board so that we can do the responsible thing and fund our own organization. Similarly, it is time to free up the Africa Union from structural and organizational constraints, including duplication and other inefficiencies, thereby facilitating it to be effective on a greater scale. As a starting point, defining the roles and functions of different organs and instruments more clearly is unavoidable. The coordination, administrative, and implementation mandate of the Commission, the legislative and oversight function of a strong Pan-African Parliament, and the political leadership, ownership, and broad policy direction of the Council all need to be reflected more clearly through rational, structural delineation. I hope, this is my prayer, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, that we finally make the right decision and build an organization that is fit for purpose, that has the requisite finances, the needed voice, and the leadership that can project Africa's position much more clearly with a strong voice so that we can take our place in the community of nations. COP27 was a turning point of tremendous magnitude because it brought home to the peoples of Africa the imperative to reconfigure our model of engagement with global and multilateral frameworks in general and the urgency of projecting a new place, role, and voice to define Africa's contribution to global development and climate action. As we reflect and deliberate upon President El Sisi's account of his, the commend, of his commend, commendable use of COP27 to facilitate the emergence of a fresh Afrocentric perspective to climate change, it is vital that we resolve to do even better and go much further at the, at, the, at the forthcoming COP28 by taking on board a more robust position and proposing a transformed and inclusive global approach to tackling the climate change crisis. This is why it is important for us to pay special attention to the Africa Climate Summit the first ever in our continent under the AU, which will take place here in Nairobi between September 4th and 6th. The summit, coming after the Paris uh, summit where greater clarity emerged, will be a critical opportunity for us to accelerate global energy transition and deliver African solutions to the COP28 in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. When we return to Nairobi in September, therefore, our sole business will be to mobilize and converge around a common position and advocate for global alignment on a green growth agenda complemented by a transformative global climate finance compact. Your participation in this summit must therefore anticipate your stronger participation in the Africa Climate Summit. And ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the summit, there are two very important things that as a continent we must harmonize, consolidate, and package our collective position. We must have a collective position on matters to do with debt and liquidity. We must all agree that it is time for a new financing mechanism. The reform of the multilateral development banks 
is no longer about if, it is when that is going to happen so that we can eliminate the current structure that is unfair to the majority of the people in Global South and especially in our African continent. None other than the UN Secretary General himself has said that our continent pay anywhere up to eight, percent, eight times more than our brothers and sisters elsewhere do. It is only fair that we have a financing mechanism that treats everybody equally. All of us have read about the animal farm where there are some that are more equal than others. <laughs> Our position is that we don't live in the animal farm, that we treat each other and all of us are treated by a financial system equally. And all we are asking, we are not asking for one financial system that favors us. No. We are asking for a financial system that is fair for everybody. Part of the challenges we have of liquidity, part of the challenges we have in debt distress is actually caused by an unfair financial architecture that makes us pay interest more than others. Today, we have a debt stock of $640 billion as Africans, paying close to $70 billion every year. If we had a fair financial architecture that treats everybody fairly and that does not profile Africa as risky, we would be paying less than half what we are paying today in debt repayments. So we are simply asking that we have a conversation, a candid conversation, on having a fairer financial system, and that is why the reform of the multilateral development banks is an urgent necessity. And secondly, that we were left behind in the fossil fuel energy industrial development. God, in his own wisdom, has put Africa at the center. We have climate change as an existential crisis to humanity. But also, we have green energy, which we have renewable energy, which we have in plenty as a, de a development imperative to be able to go into the future. That puts us at the center of the solution of the crisis of climate change. And that is a conversation we want to come and have in Nairobi because Africa, apart from having the greatest stock of renewable energy, we have other assets, minerals, that we have the largest reserves globally that can be used for uh, green energy development. We have the largest reserves of uncultivated arable land that can drive, according to Adesina, my brother, we can increase grain in our in, in, globally by up to 100%, maybe even 200%. We have the youngest population, the youngest global workforce in our continent. Ladies and gentlemen, we have what it takes to provide a solution for both decarbonization, taking the world into green industrialization, and also ensuring that we decarbonize everywhere globally. So those are the two things that we must focus our attention and be able to position our continent appropriately. And that's why I said earlier, 
We need a fit for purpose organization and we need to fund the organization ourselves. You all know it is said, he who pays the piper calls the two. When you return to Nairobi, therefore, in September, our sole business will be to mobilize and converge our common position and advocate for global alignment, as I have said, that puts Africa at the center. I take this opportunity to once more appreciate the indispensable contribution made by the AU Commission and the leadership of its chair to all arrangements and the tremendous logistical undertaking required to prepare a successful summit. It is because of this partnership with the Commission that we have made progress in laying found, uh, ground for an event that will give our continent a platform from which to launch its agenda into the global discourse. I am confident that the summit will be successful in achieving all its objectives. I wish all of us wonderful deliberations as we receive the various reports. Enjoy your time in Kenya, and God bless you. Thank you very much.